You're listening to Impulse to Innovation. The Institution of Mechanical Engineers podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Helen Mees. As a global community of mechanical engineers with over 120,000 members in 140 countries, the Institution of Mechanical Engineers has been at the heart of the engineering profession since 1847. The Institution's mission is to improve the world through engineering by sharing the latest news, views and insight into the creative world of technology and the people that make it happen. The implementation of net zero initiatives across the globe is at the forefront of most governments and leadership authorities' strategic policies. None more so than China and India, two of the world's biggest carbon emitters. South Asia has witnessed a growth in energy demand over the past two decades, increasing by over 50% since the year 2000. Rising demand has been driven by factors such as increasing populations and growth in manufacturing sectors. In Bangladesh, Bhutan, India, Nepal and Sri Lanka in particular, energy demand has grown on average by more than 5% annually over the past two decades and is expected to more than double by 2050. However, Approximately two-thirds of the energy use in South Asia is imported and the region is marred with energy shortages, erratic electricity supply, underdevelopment in renewables and energy access challenges. Growing populations, burgeoning energy demands, frequent extreme climate events like the recent record-breaking heatwave in India and Pakistan – and the geopolitical shocks like the Ukraine war are all likely to exacerbate these difficulties. According to the International Energy Agency, rapid GDP growth and electrification of energy services caused China's electricity demand to grow by 10% in 2021 to a massive 157.65 exajoules. That's faster than its economic growth at 8.4%. Yet despite the implementation of net zero policies by the Chinese government, such as the plan to be net zero by 2060, China is still responsible for around one third of global carbon dioxide emissions, remaining heavily reliant on coal as an energy source and for manufacturing. The Middle East too is powered almost exclusively on gas and oil. 77% of power came from gas in 2021 and 18% from oil. And despite its perpetual sunshine, it stands out as one of the only regions in the world where solar and wind have yet to establish themselves. Saudi Arabia has published big plans for renewables, but there has been limited demonstrable progress towards those so far. Jordan seems to be the exception to the rule, generating 23% of its electricity from wind and solar in 2021. According to the African Development Bank Group, Africa has almost unlimited potential for solar capacity, with its ability to generate a predicted 10 terawatts of power an abundance of hydro at 350 gigawatts, wind at 110 gigawatts and geothermal energy sources at 15 gigawatts. Yet the investment gap in African renewables is still overwhelming and fossil fuel companies continue to invest heavily in new fossil fuel exploitation in 48 out of the 55 African countries. With the likes of Sichuan hit by record-breaking high temperatures unseen in 60 years and the water in the region's rivers dropping to historical lows, what can the engineering community do to affect change across these vast tracts of land? I spoke with three of the institution's leading international engineers working across the energy sector to get their take on energy use and impact in India, China, Africa and the Middle East. Vijay Raman is a management consultant with over 50 years experience in logistics, transport infrastructure and energy. 
He has worked predominantly in India and South Asia, but his career has taken him all over the world. He's a fellow of the institution, a past trustee and past international vice president. Chris Cheung is chief operating officer of energy company CLP Holdings Limited in Hong Kong. Chris is responsible for a portfolio of diverse assets, including coal, hydro, solar and wind generation in China. He has over 30 years of experience in the power industry covering maintenance, plant enhancement, technical services and project engineering. Chris is a fellow of the institution and has held international strategy board positions, including Hong Kong branch chair and North East Asia regional chair. Hassan Ansari is an accomplished business executive with over 37 years experience, delivering engineering projects in Nigeria, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, China and Europe. He is a fellow of the institution, an active member of the Pakistan Regional Board and immediate past chair of the Middle East and Africa region. Good morning, everyone. And well, it's morning where I am, I suppose. Uh, You're all spread out across the globe. I'm really pleased that you could all join me this morning for for this show. I started in my introduction, I talked about the the South and East Asia regions, but but they're absolutely huge areas of, of land. They cover multiple countries. Perhaps we could begin by just sort of setting the scene for our listeners in terms of these areas and their size and scale. Vijay, if I might come to you first, the, the South Asia region, we often think that, that that is just India, but it really isn't, is it? No, it isn't really India. It's India and uh, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Nepal, Bhutan, Sri Lanka, Afghanistan too in some ways, maybe even stretching into Burma a bit or Myanmar yeah. as they call it now. And it's very large, you know, it's... Uh, the scale of it is is something like 14 or 15 times the size of Great Britain, yeah. all the British Isles put together. And the population sizes are huge. There are 1.4 billion in India, nearly 200 million in Pakistan, 150 million in Bangladesh. Uh, and so, you know, it's uh, it's a very large place and a lot of people. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And Chris, we often think of East Asia as just being China, but but that region goes far beyond just China and with a very different population density and different needs. What um what's the sort of size and scale are we are we looking at in in East Asia? Yeah, if 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 we're talking about the Northeast Asia, we're definitely not talking about only China. Uh China being one well the biggest one, but uh, we also cover Indonesia, Japan, Philippines, Vietnam. Uh, I think in terms of population, uh, only China we got about one point four billion population. Yeah, you know, together we are the a smaller country, at least total about two billion population. Um, oh. So it's it, and also it's it's cut a wide range of culture uh, across the region. So in terms of energy consumption and energy need, then it's it, it's a vast array of, of different groups of people needing all kinds of different sorts of energy needs. So in the last few years, uh, the energy consumption, certainly in, in South and, and East Asian regions, has significantly increased. Indeed, South Asia has witnessed a growth in energy demand over 50% since 2000. Uh, and China's total energy usage rose, rose by 3% year on year for the first half of 2022 alone. That's yeah. 4.1 trillion kilowatt hours uh, for our listeners to understand. That's mm. according to the National Energy Administration. What mm. What's driving this energy consumption increase, do you think? Can I sort of make a generalized statement, Helen? Of course, yeah. yeah. So I, I think it's really the energy needs that fuel development. And it's almost a truism that the more energy you consume up to a limit is uh, connected with your development and your improved economic status per capita yeah so now 
what's happening at, at this time is that this is the time at which India is sort of growing at a much faster pace for energy consumption right now. But when you compare it, compare India to China, China has already finished doing that development phase and is now consolidating. So when you look at per capita consumption, well, way at the top are some of the countries in the Gulf, followed by the United States. And then you have all the other developed countries in the EU, Japan, and so on, at about 35, 40,000 kilowatt hours per person consumption. Not in terms of kilowatt hours per se, but th all the energy needs converted to that. And then you have e India way down at about a quarter of that figure. So what's happening in India is that that figure is growing by leaps and bounds. And it's a sort of catch up. And when that happens, it sounds very mild. But when you consider 1.4 billion people or 2 billion people in the subcontinent, then that's a very large number at the, even that low rate. Yeah. So suddenly, the largest energy in totality consumption is China, because 1.4 billion people. Then the United States, with a very high per capita, but a much smaller population compared to China, about a quarter of China's, followed by India. And India is continuing to grow. So this is a pure development problem. And the conundrum is how to make that as green as possible at the least possible cost, because all the inexpensive methods of doing it and the non-polluting methods of doing it are over. Yeah. The pollution has been done and gone for the last 150 years when knowledge was less. And today's situation is we know very well that if you take cheap and inexpensive forms of energy like coal, you're going to end up being a very big polluter. Of course. That's the conundrum. Yeah, absolutely. And, and Chris, is, is that the same? I mean, there's going to be different issues associated, I suppose, with, with East and North Asia as well. Yeah, I, I couldn't like, disagree agree more with uh, Richard about the development. I mean, the, the increase in energy consumption is mainly uh, due to the, you know, the rate of development in the region or in the various countries within the region. Maybe I give some figures for for people to understand the scale. Like, you know, you look at the GDP, you know, uh, for China it, uh, in, in these two years, about 18, 18 trillion. Japan is 4.9, India 3.1, uh, uh, South Korea, Australia, Indonesia is, is the range of 1.2 to 1.8 trillion. So, it's a huge um, economical growth over the years. Uh, as Raji mentioned, China may be getting into a bit more consolidated state, but they're still talking about 5% growth this year, right? Uh, and, 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 and together with other countries, all together, the, the whole region uh, are having a very fast and big economical growth. And to fill all this, you have to have the corresponding energy uh, supply. And I guess that is the main reason driving for the very huge increase in terms of energy consumption over the year. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And of course, there are there are significant external forces putting pressure on on the region as well, aren't there? In, in terms of, I'm thinking of things like, obviously, the long-term impact of COVID and the ongoing war in the Ukraine. How is Asia and um, the, the areas around Asia, how are they coping with this impact? Uh, and what are they doing in the short term to mitigate some of these issues? Well, they are trying to address the conundrum I mentioned. And that is the issue that... You need, you need cheap sources of energy, but you also want to try and make that transition to green and greener forms of energy because the greener forms are clearly the non-polluting forms. But can one afford to get to the greener forms quickly in the same manner as the advanced countries are trying to do? Or is it going to take a little more time? Well, even amongst the developing countries 
here, like the large Mars in Northeast Asia and the smaller Mars in uh, South Asia, there is a big difference in that, as I said, China has reached a stage of sort of stability and is then now consolidating where it yeah. grows at about 5% instead of at a frenetic 11%. It had even reached 11% growth at one stage for six continuous years. And that was a period beginning from about 1968 for about 30 years. Yeah. And therefore, for the last 10 years or so, it's been slowing down a little bit. But slowing down is relative. You know, it is relative to the 10% growth that is now 5%. And India is relatively increasing to the 7% growth instead of being at 5%. But both of them have the same objective, which is to try and get its, their people into a better standard of living in terms of per capita income, in ter terms of their lifestyles and so many other things without making some of the errors that were made in the West when the West did not have that much information about what were the impacts on natural resources, mother nature, the way the world functions, greenhouse gases and the like. Those are all realizations that have only slowly sunk in. And for us to take the same measures as in the West is going to take us a little longer. Like, China might get to net zero by maybe 2050 or 2055, but India won't get there till 2060 or 2065. And of course, every, every year counts because we are not talking of the two countries. One is the largest creator or user of energy in gross terms, that's China. One is the third largest in gross terms, that is India. So between them, they dwarf the rest of the world. And we have to take these steps. There's no question. We must do it. But can we do it by suppressing growth for the people, reducing their energy consumption per capita? We have to be efficient in our energy consumption. And I think in that, we can get great leads from many Western countries, which also are trying to make their energy consumption less, uh, you know, less exorbitant. Yeah. That is, a unit of energy consumed will produce a much better output in terms of GDP. That's the process that we have to learn from the West, get help from the West. When I say West, I mean the advanced countries. Yeah. Singapore is also part of the West, but uh, of the advanced countries, but is very much in our midst in the East. It's a very advanced country, and they are taking lots of interesting steps. But they are a city-state. There are only 5 million people. So that's an easy th task, one could say, in some ways, to deal yes, with. Yes, in, in terms of the scale and, and, yeah. uh, and the, the rural issues associated rural with many issues of these for, countries yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, getting energy into those uh, regions is, is particularly yeah. tricky. Yeah. Chris, is that the same then for, for China in terms of how these external forces are affecting the market or the region is so big that it's just not seeing any impact from, from these uh, situations? Yeah, I think I think it's very similar. I mean, no no one country will be single alone. You know, in the in the, in the modern world, everything is center link. Uh, I think China has become a uh, you know the world world world's second largest oil consumer over the past years. So we 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 are linked with the whole world, and and you know all this will affect uh, what China did and. Of course, I think uh, China and many other countries actually are also facing similar issue like what G mentioned. When we are developing, so you are, you are coming to a dynamic between how you're going to balance between you know the, the development yet the, the longer term uh, effect of the environment. You have to manage, uh, you want to feel the development, but at the same time, you really want to uh, contribute to to manage the emission to the environment, but that's no no easy solution, especially when you are talking about the mass and the scale of the growth. You are talking about very very complicated uh, 
optimization of many, many activities from different aspects. So I think China facing the same. But I think what we all do are, are very similar. We try to um, you know, optimize, increase the efficiency of the generation technology uh, and also shifting you know, at the quickest pace we can to more renewable energy. I know, go away from the fossil fuel, but you can't turn this around overnight. You have to do it uh, at a you know at a prudent prudent uh, way, so that you can you can on one hand uh, support the economic growth, but on the other hand you 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 have to work out some kind of uh, reduction over time. So it's not something you can do it. There's no quick fix solution. But yeah. you need to have a more strategic and longer term uh, plan to work on that, uh, because there's so many concurrent activity you have to uh, manage over time in order to achieve this goal. Yeah, absolutely, Hassan. I was hoping that um, you'd be able to give us some idea of what's happening in the the Middle East and and North Africa. That's an area that we we don't often associate with sort of the energy consumption. We think around it's a producer of of oil. Are you seeing any issues in in that area in terms of of energy consumption and the external forces such as the the Ukrainian war that that are having an effect? Uh, on the region? Uh, my um, observation is actually Middle East and Africa is a very, very large uh, large area, as you know. And it's a, the economically very diverse countries with very, very different challenges. I, I'll pick up first from where Vijay had uh, mentioned, um, you know, the uh, consumption per capita, what it is uh, right now, obviously, is very low compared to the developed countries so it, it 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 shows us how much how much potential there is to be tapped but obviously it also depends when you're comparing with the developed world uh, you have to have the same economic uh, levels of development also so considering where people are today uh, in in most of the middle east africa region um, they still face shortages of supply. So the consumption uh, is, demand is present, but it's not satisfied. Right. Um, so that's, that's an area where a uh, right. lot of engineering and technology thought has to go in because um, uh, how to bring affordable uh, energy, which is now more a matter of uh, right as part of right to life uh, than anything else. So that's one one area which actually yeah. shows us how much potential there is and how much attention uh, people like us need to put in. Then now uh, I'll, I'll try and divide it into two uh, parts. One part of the Middle East Africa region is, is the developing country uh, countries. Some of those I've worked in in Africa also. Uh, in the energy sector. And then uh, there are uh, oil-rich uh, economies, right? In the, in the oil-rich economies, we are now seeing, regardless of the Ukraine war, uh, they've been heavily dependent on oil historically for their own generation, oil and gas, uh, uh, basically, for their own power generation, as well as for uh, exporting the oil, right? Now, uh, when I was working in Saudi Arabia, for example, I was horrified to see that certain things, certain aspects like, you know, a combined cycle for small power plants were not even part of the scope of the projects. So they were simple cycle uh, generator based uh, projects which were being put in. And um, something that in the development developing world elsewhere in the Middle East Africa region or in, in Europe and, and the US would be unthinkable to, to put in uh, power generating units without recovering the heat and generating secondary power. So the, the, the lack of attention to uh, utilization of or taking the full 
sort of uh, benefiting from the full potential of the energy wasn't there now we are seeing uh, in the last few years we are seeing more attention in the gulf and middle east in the oil rich countries towards solar and diversification into nuclear uh, power in the uh, less developed countries like africa or or subcontinent or where we uh, some other parts of western asia the the problems are um, quite interesting um, and these are related to a uh, projection of demand and that is an interesting area i've been part of that for example in west africa as well as in pakistan demand the issue is goes to planning energy basket you really need to first see in even from an economic generation point of view if you if you set the environmental aspects to one side there are enormous resources in all of the countries to generate uh, hydro power or solar or or wind for that respect but if you look at how much uh, power they actually generate from renewables is very low and suddenly when people have to respond quickly to energy crisis they rush into thermal power straight away without thinking yeah. of the consequences and that creates further uh, disbalances in the basket the third area where really uh, people like ourselves need to pay attention is the over regulation of the energy market in the, in all these countries if you look at how uh, much regulation there is for something as basic necessity so so um, in the distribution side on the generation side on the transmission side uh, uh, it it's it actually works uh, against uh, the people the users and the consumers because with so much uh, regulation and so much control um people actually end up not getting the powers exactly what these regulations and what these controls are put in for so this is the third biggest challenge in this part of the world in in the oil rich countries the planning aspect uh and energy basket and projection of demand against supply is not so much of a problem but uh, in the other countries uh, this is a, a major issue so that's that's my my two bits uh, of um, findings or my experience over west africa middle east and, and pakistan yes it's interesting hasan how you how you contrast uh, so distinctly between the 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 regions there and and that's quite interesting i'd like to to ask a question really now about hasan you touched on it there about the infrastructure Uh, of these areas and particularly across uh, south and east asia in terms of tr- transport use for example and, and what heavy industry and manufacturing uh, are doing to make changes uh, to the way that they operate uh, what are you seeing you know all of you in terms of uh, how industry is reacting to energy efficiency helen i i think industry is coming into this challenge very well i could give you an example of some of the heavy energy industries like cement production and uh, uh, steel production these are these industries use a lot of el- electrical energy and then they have now taken to setting up green hydrogen plants in their vicinity 
because one of the big problems with green hydrogen is first you have to generate it, then you have to transmit it, and then you have to store it. Yeah. So if you have a large consumer right next door, then it makes a lot of sense. So a cement plant with green hydrogen next door or a steel plant with ditto, that's a fine way of moving forward. And I'm sure China has many examples of that as well because it's the first obvious thing to do. The other problem on transportation is that all of our countries have these difficulties where the major source of private transportation is two-wheelers. And I shudder at the thought of green hydrogen being distributed to a bunch of two-wheeler operators. Now, actually, there is a lot of good technology available to make such hydrogen fairly safe in a sort of, uh, what's the word for it? It's like a plasticine. But that technology is wrapped up and is actually only available in a stage of development that is active in Germany. So right. how do we make a change? We could make that change with collaborative efforts where technologies are transferred and some degree of financial aspects also come in so that both from the financial angle and the technological angle, people are encouraged to take to these kinds of trends. And it's all very well to say we can have battery-operated two-wheelers. Yes, of course we can. But the power source must then not be based on dirty coal. Yeah. It has to be based on good, clean sources of electricity. Things like uh, nuclear power, uh, solar power, things like wind energy, particularly at the continental shelf depth of about minus 50 meters, because otherwise you have long periods when all of these things come down to zero. No wind, no wind turbine functions, and so forth. And for all of this, there are solutions coming in now in big packets. Uh, again, with a lot of work that's been done in Northeast Asia, Japan, Korea, and so on, as well as in Scotland, Norway, and the United States for these kinds of green energy, hydrogen, deep sea offshore. And last year when uh, the, the UK Prime Minister came to India, they signed an agreement which really sent shivers up my spine because they said that off the coast of southern India, at a place where for the last two decades there's been a battle going on between farmers who don't want any nuclear power in their backyards. Off that coast, they want to build a wind farm at about minus 50 meters depth and use this technology that has been developed in Scotland to try and do that. And I hope things like that come to fruition very, very soon. Uh, we can do with it. You know, we when you are increasing consumption by 10% a year, you can certainly get in a much larger share of that out of green sources than you would normally. Yeah. And that, over a period of time, will get us to that spot. And similarly, when China starts giving up 30-year-old uh, coal-fired steam turbines, it would also change over gradually to these kinds of processes. But as uh, Chris was saying, it takes a little time to get these things done. We are trying to do in a generation what the developed world has done in about four or five generations. Yeah. And we have to do it. We have to. It's not, that we, 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 it's not that we want to delay. We must do it. But at the same time, we can't allow a situation where we have cheap sources of energy and the energy sources we don't use because we want to be green. You know that that yeah. doesn't that, that that's that conundrum I said we have to tackle. Yeah, there's, there's no point in trying to be green for the sake of being green. Yeah, uh, and I thought I yeah. I thought I I I would encapsulate what Hassan was talking about Africa in a sort of joke, in the in the sense that, you know, China has made that step forward and can now consolidate. India is making that step forward now. When Africa makes that step forward, Nigeria and, and Ethiopia between them may have something like 800 million people. And they would need these sources of energy. 
so we must find solutions for all that now so that when they come to that stage they can get it done and the joke i wanted to say is that nigeria is an oil producer part of opec but if you look at its uh, power supply arrangement my nigerian friends i have many they have a great sense of humor according to them the acronym p h c n which is power holding corporation of nigeria actually means please keep candle nearby <laughs> Yes, and and that's an interesting point as well, isn't it, Vijay? That um, d- despite the wealth of some of these nations in terms of the power that they produce and the uh, the materials that they have, their resources that they have to hand, don't necessarily trickle down to uh, society as a whole. And there's a whole conversation we could have about the socio political issues of of energy, I suppose. Yes, indeed, we can. Chris, if I- if I might come to you in terms of this question, you know, how is heavy industry and manufacturing coping with these these changes, and and are they uh, are they receptive to the opportunities that um, more greener sources of energy might bring? Yeah, um, I think you 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 all probably know uh, uh, the infrastructure investment in in mainland China are heavily. You know, driven by the policy, um, uh, they have a relatively centralized planning direction, which drive uh, a lot of the investment in in all fronts. Um, I think one of the key policy we see recently is is the policy announced by President Xi about the twenty thirty um, neutralize carbon in twenty sixty, uh, reaching the 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 peak on by 2030 and neutralize by 2060. This is a very important target set by the, the president of, of the of the whole China. And with that, that means they are driving to um, on one hand we cannot you know uh, um, you know abandon uh, fossil fuel immediately but uh, the policy will drive the efficiency gain on the fossil fuel um, generating technology. Get rid of the smaller plant, get rid of those uh, smaller unit, only focus on the um, you know, large scale, high performance uh, fossil fuel generation plant, invest a lot on the environmental abatement to make sure that those coal fire unit can still be generated, but with you know relatively um, acceptable emission and in parallel they need to increase the proportion of generating on renewable and nuclear. Nuclear is also one of the, the target but to a much smaller proportion but renewable is, is the biggest one. So in the next 10 to 20 years there will be a much large proportion of renewable to be built in China including onshore, offshore uh, and at the same at the same time, the government also encouraged the manufacturer, like manufacturer of wind turbine, manufacturer of uh, solar panel, to invest um, more efficient product to f- to fill up this need. And because China is is by itself is quite huge, so it can also create a sufficient market to drive the manufacturer. So. If the policy is to, to drive for more renewable, um, the utility will use to, will, to think about to invest, while the manufacturer will also see the incentive because there's more customer. So they will work on the development of high efficiency product. So that's on the generation part. For the transmission um, in China, they also invest a lot into the overall national um, transmission network because in, in China uh, a lot of economy are along the coastal part while a lot of the resources natural resources may be rich on the middle or the west part of the country so actually the country are also building a lot of large scale high volt AC DC transmission line you know trying to transport cheap resources, energy from the west to the east. 
and vice versa, you know. So that can also help to optimize the, the overall resources of the whole country to, to fill up the necessary economic growth. And that will also encourage the investment of, of the manufacturer, like an in, uh, manufacturer of high-volt DC, overhead line cables, transformer to invest. Uh, in, in parallel, we, they, uh, China also uh, focused to, to transform the transportation industry. Um, they also have policy to demand some of the part, uh, city to transform into all electrification for public transport. Right. As well as we all know, um, the, the, the growth of the EV vehicle in, in China uh, once they can build up the sufficient um, momentum and, and, and volume, the price will drop. And that will also encourage a lot of people, together with the policy to discourage a few, you know, a, a petrol vehicle, encourage EV uh, vehicle, then the customer will, 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 will look for a EV vehicle rather than a petrol car. Yeah. And we can see this kind of proportion uh, raising uh, huge quickly uh, in the past year and go in, in the coming year as well. Uh, other than that, they also have storage. Uh, so China also looking into um, storage of energy like battery or different kind of storage capacity. Because I think everybody in the whole world uh, are facing the, the, the issue of uh, changing from a you know, more controllable um, fossil fuel generation to more uncontrolled uh, renewable energy. But yet you have to manage the stability of supply uh, to, su- to, to support the, the need. And this is a, it's a big issue that everybody have to face. And energy storage could be one area to, to help to, you know, work this out. And also like, you know, uh, moving away from totally centralized generation into more distributed generation, together with the digitization um, transformation, so you can make use of much more of the digital tools to help to optimize the demand and supply. Uh, yeah. So all these are, are the kind of uh, direction that at least uh, China is working at the moment. Um, uh, but we are talking again, we get back to the, the volume, we are talking about a lot of, a huge amount of this. So um, uh, it's a lot of things going on to concurrently. And, and the government could do a bit of a policy to help to direct or to even to set up the rule to help all the practitioner within this industry to, to act on a way that will 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 jointly support the um, you know the reduction of uh, emission over time, yet to help to fill the economy grow. Yeah, you, you make a really good point, Chris, as well that the the opportunities for investment as well into the manufacture of these renewable equipment actually could really uh, boost the economies uh, of, of these countries as well, which uh, is something that we don't often think about. So, yeah, you, you make some very good points there. Uh, Hassan, I, I know Vijay has, has kind of preempt maybe a little bit about Africa's issues there in terms of infrastructure, but what, what are you seeing in terms of how industries within the north of Africa are kind of adopting uh, these new technologies? Yeah, um, I think I'm, I'm more a subject matter expert on industry uh, than logistics of en- uh, energy, right? So most of my response would cover the industry side, yeah, sure. right? Um, so um, basically um, what is um, happening is in industry, uh, the the owners and manufacturers are are faced with increasing energy costs and also an an unpredictability owing to the global situation, including what's going on in the Ukraine. Uh, And that is forcing them to look at alternates. And one of the easiest alternatives right now available to people is solar. Um, So uh, when they start putting in solar, uh, the decisions 
generally are taken in isolation. It's it's more a technical uh, uh, discussion among in the industry. Uh, the other area people are getting forced to look at is uh, how the energy is used. It's not what where you're getting it from or how you're getting getting it how you have configured your operations and the processes that you are fully utilizing the energy. Uh, these are the two areas I'll just expand upon uh, for a moment. So the first one, um, increasingly the buzzword is microgrid. Now, microgrid is currently being offered mostly by manufacturers like General Electric and all or other manufacturers of solar equipment who are actually trying to promote microgrid concept in industry and industrial estates and even housing estates, etc. Uh, trying to pitch it as a subset of the supply and services. So it's driven by manufacturers. What is happening slowly now is a realization amongst the industries that uh, you have to, manufacturer may do that, but you really need to look at the microgrid as a tool for improving your energy consumption and energy mix. Because each industry now has options of various sources of energy from the grid. You can now increasingly opt for which supplier you want the energy from. And also solar and sometimes energy generated or recovered from your own process and also thermal energy that you may have set up or you want to set up uh, as a, in a mix. Now, uh, what is happening is that um, increasingly with microgrid, people are looking at the cost of energy delivered as a unit cost. So work out the mix that you are you have your own generation recovered or from the grid or other sources and see what it what it actually costs per unit and you try and optimize it based on what your consumption pattern is so effectively the planning for an energy in the industry uh, is shifting from purely an engineer's domain to, to an accountant's or a business manager domain because the, the bottom line factor is cost of energy delivered. And in that, uh, increasingly, because of the solar option, increasingly the environmental aspects and uh, your carbon footprint gets improved. So that's one area. The other area is that um, historically, Manufacturing plants and process plants, when they are engineered, by that I mean when all the elements are put in together in, in a process according to the process concept, most of the concentration is on process efficiencies. So the KPIs given to the design engineers and uh, technologists has been traditionally process efficiency. Energy is something that gets delivered. Energy efficiency just gets delivered because historically the concept was because you're using efficient equipment, energy efficient equipment, in the end, uh, you will have an energy optimized process plant. It, does, it doesn't work like that because it's how uh, the KPIs given to the plant engineers uh, is not energy efficiency. It's changing now. But um, it, it has been historically, and most of the existing factories, in, in system, uh, existing manufacturing units are lugged with assets where uh, not enough attention was originally given to energy efficiency when you brought all the components together and look at what modes of production it will work in. So this is something that is now uh, being corrected by, by the industries. And it's a painful process, but because you, you, you're you committed to the assets, you have your challenges, etc. in the market, uh, yet uh, you are being outcompeted by newer plants who have been designed for energy efficiency as a whole in, in addition to process efficiencies. So this is this is something that uh, that's now increasingly uh, a trend. And just 
one more point to support what I'm saying and to explain what I mean. Um, you know, you can have energy efficient motors, you can have higher efficiency uh, pumping unit, etc. Um, it doesn't mean that when you put it in a combination with the rest of the plant, the whole plant will be the optimized energy user. And that's where the challenge is for engineers like us increasingly to look at how complete plants are put together and where the efficiencies will come from. It's not just a matter of energy has to be brought in and supplied and something uh, production efficiencies will be achieved and expect that some energy efficiencies will come. Thanks, Hassan. I wanted to come on to the issue of of climate change uh, and sustainability in terms of energy use and and what these areas of the world are doing. There's been increasing incidences of of high temperatures, of fires, floods, storms across the globe. Uh, Sichuan, for example, um, was hit by record high temperatures in 2022, unseen for 60 years, according to um, uh, metrologists. These kind of environmental changes are having an increasing effect, not just on the population, but also on the energy infrastructure itself. What kind of mitigations uh, are you seeing the energy uh, suppliers putting in place to to overcome some of these uh, issues? And, and what can we learn from, from the work that they're doing? I think, uh, yes, I think we, we all see the extreme weather um, are happening more and more frequently and to a larger scale in the whole world. Um, and... You know, just like my company, we, we, we operate in mainland with various renewable assets. We, we see uh, the frequency of those issues happening uh, increase. And it's, it's rather difficult because, you, you know, no one really can control and, and predict uh, what happened from, the, from, from, the, from nature. Uh, what, what we try to do, I can see some of what we do is we try to um, conduct more, you know, scenario planning. We try to imagine what could, you know, happen uh, more than what we, we would expect at this moment. And then to analyze the scenario to see what will be the impact. By doing so, we can, we can at least try to predict what kind of damage could be caused by some unexpected emergency situation or unexpected extreme situation uh, onto our plan, onto our people or nearby population. Uh, with those kind of uh, study, we can at least to uh, estimate a- additional potential risks. And by looking at those risks, we can consider whether it's worthwhile for us to, you know, to, to conduct certain enhancement within the system. To help us to have a more robust system to 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 cope with uh, this kind of you know extreme weather situation, but if we cannot you know because of the scale of that happen is 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 no way a, a particular asset could could control, then we have we can at least based on that to to work out some kind of contingency arrangement emergency response. Uh, to help us to try to detect uh, that uh, happen. And we have uh, proper training and proper emergency plan, uh, drill, et cetera, so that if we really happen to, uh, to face that kind of extreme situation, at least we are in a better position of preparedness, uh, we can respond faster. We have necessary uh, provision of emergency, logistic, uh, communication, etc., to help us to better manage that kind of uh, situation. That is on the micro level. Uh, for the mega level, uh, you know, like, like in, in you know, mainland China, I think they also see, uh, for example, uh, last year we have a, you know, really extreme uh, drop in the in the in the central part, you know, say Sichuan. A lot of our hydro plant got got stuck without water. Yeah. And that actually affect a lot of the um you know the generation 
normal generation to support the the economy. Uh, we we in the past they even can transport a lot of this power from the Sichuan area to the to the eastern area of of you know a uh, uh, coastal city, but because of that, we will we will we'll make the um. The, the energy balance uh, 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 affected a lot. So in response to that, we we have, you know, you have to review your overall system, you know, sustainability to see whether you need to adjust the generation ratio. You need to adjust the um, reliant on a single source of uh, energy uh, for each of the province to see whether you need to do a bit of adjustment so that you don't. You don't rely on one particular source because if you put all your egg on one basket, you're you're more likely to sub, you know, subject to a, a huge damage. But if you can try to spread around your your risk profile, you're you're in a better position under <laughs> under various situation. So I think that is what I can I see uh, you know some of the um, measure that we have taken in, in in China. Yeah, building in redundancy into into the systems uh, of supply, I think, is fundamental, isn't it? In in terms of dealing with some of these extreme situations, um, and that's clearly clearly what China are looking to do, um, having suffered uh, such heat issues over the last uh, twelve months. Uh, VJ, is this a similar thing that's happening in India, or? Are they taking a different approach to to managing climate crisis? No, it's the same approach as Chris was mentioning, and I think that that's also a sort of universal way of moving forward. You know, all of us, for instance, started by trying to reduce our own electricity consumption in some manner or form by moving away from. The old filament lighting to CFLs and now LEDs, and all of this required a tremendous change in manufacturing and policy issues and so forth. And uh, for a long period of time, government actually gave away many of these things free, so that every household was encouraged to shift as rapidly as possible to LED. And that did have a terrific impact in the sense that. In so many areas of so many countries, the demand for electricity from the domestic sector dropped sharply, and it it was a it was a wake up call to to us to see how wasteful we had all become as human beings. Yeah. So, I think that that lesson has stayed, and people are trying to see whether they can't do things more efficiently, uh, use less energy. And get away from the syndrome that in order to become per capita wealthy, you have to become massively per capita consumptive of energy. Try and do it with more bang for the buck for the energy you consume, and that is something that I hope stays. And we've all had to uh, learn the hard lesson that when it comes to Nature, you can't predict that a cyclone will turn north or south or move this way or that way. You just have to be prepared. So everyone in every state of this large country has started looking at disaster management as a subject of itself on how we should try to cope with these things. And there are many things involved in it besides just the. Immediate relief that all our TV crews focus on, you know, picking up people who have been buried under、uh, landslide, homes smashed, and so forth. Sometimes we find later on that those houses weren't built properly at the correct place without looking properly into what the soil could bear.、Yeah. So one was inviting the disaster. And that's very sad because it's man-made. So these are all these kinds of. There are myriad issues, and these issues need tackling. And it, collectively, when we put them all together, you get that terrific impact that one got out of changing over the light bulb. Who would have thought twenty years ago that just putting a kind of light bulb bulb out of service would end up with your actually getting such gross amounts of electricity saved? That some thermal power plants can be shut down. Yeah, this、uh, th- this was inconceivable, I would say, in 
I, I remember, uh, VJ, when the, the British government um, circulated those new lamps to to people around the UK um, and we were all in awe of these uh, newfangled uh, energy efficient bulbs and now it, it seems like it's it's just an accepted thing. But you yeah. make a very good point there about the resilience of, of the systems and and that in itself is going to be something that, that engineers uh, I'm guessing are, are going to be at the forefront yeah. of, of ensuring that we are well prepared for these weather anomalies more and more uh, so over the coming years, rather than waiting until they've happened and then dealing with the problems afterwards. Yeah, um, yeah. And you make a very good point there that that's something that we as engineers are going to have to adopt as part of our training, as part of our understanding, Absolutely. to be very m- yeah. much more resilient uh, and prepared for, for these kind of mishaps. Hassan, um, I'm guessing the the issues associated with weather, particularly uh, in in Africa, the the heat and so on, is in- increasing quite rapidly. What what kind of of mitigations are are you seeing being taken to to deal with that kind of climate t- temperature change, particularly? Both the gentlemen before me have said well, elaborated uh, the subject very well, so I w- I'll try not to repeat that. Let me build on that a little. You know, we, we talked about the light bulb and um, the savings, and the next, I think the barrier is on the transport side. If we are able to do something about uh, the fuel consumption, motor vehicles, etc., that is the second big challenge and big barrier to cross. So, um, I just want to say, just to elaborate what you said earlier, it's it's become a very common theme to talk about the disasters, etc., that uh, the climate change has uh, has shown us. One of the interesting things I was uh, learning was that, you know, uh, earlier in the in the last century, most of the cyclones in the Indian Ocean were in the Bay of Bengal. And in the as we are have moved into this current century, the twenty first century, uh, the cyclones, most of the cyclones are on the on the western side of the subcontinent, uh, in the Arabian Sea, and uh, it's just because um, the temperature rise and the differential on the Arabian Sea side is higher. Right. And now the implications, because the implications of of this. Yeah are not uh, affecting only one country. Uh, It's it's going to uh, have enormous change imposed on us in the way we live, the way we do agriculture, the way we handle our water resources, etc. And and, uh, so, so there'll be, you know, over time, there'll be more, less rain on the, in the Bangladesh area and Eastern and subcontinent. And more on this side, and the cyclones, the wind patterns, the monsoon patterns will also change, consequently affecting the lives of billions of people. Now, um, the the changes we are seeing, there's an in, on the industry side, particularly because I work on the industry side. The one change we are seeing that people are, are taking steps is the energy accounting and the carbon accounting being built into ERP systems and uh, aligned with the financial uh, component of the ERP. Now, that actually enables a lot of corporations, particularly those which are working with their customers who are now looking at compliance uh, on energy and carbon uh, footprint. Um, That enables them to have a much, much, much sharper focus and have something that they can count on their fingertips, etc., feel and on a daily basis in the shape of numbers and uh, data uh, to control their operations. So that's an area where we are seeing increasing interest on part of the industry and manufacturers to have carbon accounting and their carbon footprint and energy consumptions built deeper into their ERP system. So that's an area. The second area is increasingly KPIs for energy. Now, previously the KPIs for energy were were the domain of the production engineers, etc. 
it they are becoming business KPIs and how well integrated they become into uh, into the business KPIs is uh, something that industrialists are focusing on. You make some very good points there, Hassan. The impact of changing weather patterns, which is directly related to climate change, is going to significantly affect places previously in touch by these extremes. That's something I don't think global governments have truly grasped yet. And it's now becoming as as much of an emergency as, as addressing the climate crisis itself. Clearly, there is still much for engineers across the energy sector to do in in terms of addressing this. Chris, Vijay and Hassan, thank you so much for joining me today from all of the regions across the world where you're based. It's been an absolute pleasure to speak to you and to hear how the engineering communities across the globe are addressing energy issues, adapting to climate conditions and affecting change to improve the world through engineering. There will be more for us to talk about on this subject, I am sure, in the near future. Thank you very much. That's all for this month and indeed for this year. Thank you for listening to our 40th episode of Impulse to Innovation. We will be back in February 2024 for Season 5 with an exciting look at new trends in engineering innovation and the engineers that make it happen. Have a wonderful holiday from all of us at eye to eye You've been listening to Impulse to Innovation, the Institution of Mechanical Engineers podcast. Thanks for listening. We'd love to hear from you. So if you'd like to share any news or any feedback with us, then please email us podcast at imeke.org. All the information on this episode can be found in the episode notes 